Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Luis. We are going to be waiting maybe a couple of minutes more, still below 30 people. It's quite a few people enrolled to the meeting. So we'll await three more minutes before start. Okay, very well, good morning, and thank you very much for joining us today um, for this um, webinar. The title of our webinar today is uh, the configuration of the Connex Solar Equipment from Schneider. Um, this webinar follows on the steps of three previous very successful webinars, um, which were mostly oriented at equipment familiarization. Um, today we're going to dive in a little bit more into the configuration of the equipment. Um, quick tips into the important um, things that needs to be considered to um, put the equipment together and to successfully design and deploy from very small to very large um, solar systems. So without any new delay, I'm going to start with the presentation. So here we have a small disclaimer. Um, 
it's very important that, uh, that you keep in mind that the information used to prepare this presentation all come from the approved documentation from the OEM from Schneider. Um, it can be found in a much deeper level of detail on Schneider's solar web page, um, to which you have a link down below there in the slide. You will all be receiving a copy of this presentation, so no need to worry. So you will be getting that link as well through the PDF of the presentation. So again, Schneider's, Schneider has put together a very compelling suite of products that can actually cover most, if not all, applications that will be required from a, a solar energy system that actually do handle batteries. The batteries can be used for backup. The batteries can be used as a way to enhance the autonomy of the solar system, right? So we can save surplus energy. You said uh, at times where the, where the energy is required off peak or solar peak. Um, so we have in this sense uh, four groups of, uh, if you will, of, of products. We have the, the two types of inverters. Connex XW being the smaller, more residential um, oriented type of inverter. Um, it's uh, roughly a 5 kV inverter. And then we have the XW Plus, soon to be superseded by the XW Pro later this year for the IEC market, um, which is an eight and a half kilowatt inverter. Okay, so XW is a, is a single unit type of system, so it can can only be installed one per system. While XW Plus is highly scalable, right? So you can have up to nine inverters on a on a single installation. So then we have as well um, the DC solar chargers on the bottom, which is the 80 amp and 60 amp. Um, I have not included in the presentation, but soon will be made available to as well to the EC market. It's a 100 amp solar charger. So um, these are the devices that actually regulate the charge to the batteries and the DC bus um, from the solar energy. And then we have a group of accessories, right? So uh, we have the battery monitor, which is used to calculate the state of charge um, on the application of batteries. We have the system control panel, or SCP, which is essentially just a very fancy LCD display, which is used to configure the equipment. Um, we have the automatic generator start, which handles the interaction of the, of the inverters with the generators, if generators are in the system. And we have for today as well, the Connex gateway. In the gateway, um, the master HMI of, of, of the control of the system. In other words, is the master data logger um, of the system, the ones that gather information from all devices. Um, and it shows us into a very nice graphical interface, which we will see, and fits our cloud uh, interface comments inside too. So now, um, the XW inverters and SW inverters have been designed with DC couple systems and AC couple systems in mind. Um, there is pros and cons of both. Um, Particularly on three-phase um, AC couple systems tends to be preferred for larger systems. Uh, they are more efficient and less complicated to put together. Um, but Connex XW, which is sort of smaller inverter, can handle AC AC coupling on the, on the load, on the load, on the load output. So, um, as with any other inverter on the market, um, this frequency shifting um, is limited to a maximum recommended pairing of this of, of the PV inverter on the, on the load output side of one to one to the battery inverter size. So in other words, if you can see there with a little solar panel that is in the top in between the two houses, that's your PV inverter, complete that inverter. That inverter is feeding power to an AC bus. So it's in parallel with the output of your battery inverter. So your battery inverter and your PV inverter needs to coexist when in a off-grid situation, when there is no, no grid supply to the house. And that happens by having your battery inverter to fluctuate its output frequency in order to command a reduction or increase of the power output from the PV inverter. PV inverter has a linear relationship of power versus frequency. So as the battery inverter uh, changes the output frequency, so does the PV inverter changes or, or power, its power output. So that's what we call IC coupling and it can be done in a number of different configurations. Or you can have a more normal standard type of DC couple system, which is one into which all the energy generated goes to a common DC bus. It will be the little greenhouse to the right. And essentially the energy goes out of the XW, SW inverter, either to the loads or back to the grid if there is excess. Okay. So um, with the other benefit that if we have Schneider solar products for the whole family and we use 
um, PV inverters from Schneider Solar on the AC couple application, we can monitor them as well through the same monitoring group, which will be using the same monitoring device, the gateway. So, um, while there is significant hardware differences in between the SW models and the XW plus models, in general, they do operate with the same um, energy priority um, um, systems. So the inverters can be used essentially on three modes. So the first one will be used a pure backup mode. Pure backup mode, the inverter will be on, on pass through continuously. The energy of the grid will be going through the inverter into the loads continuously. And the inverter only goes into inverter mode when there is a grid failure. Okay, so essentially it's a backup device. Um, now, this is not an online backup device. There is no double conversion. Um, both SW and, X, and XW plus inverters work um, in, a, in a sense grid tight with the with municipal supply or with the grid. So, um, so there, is, there is no double conversion. AC DC, the AC AC. So essentially the, the inverter, as you can see there on the image, is in parallel with the grid. Uh, it's just that when there is a power outage, the inverter will very quickly open a relay, will isolate the grid. So the inverter can keep supplying the loads to the to the household, to whatever loads you have put into the inverter. So this has a small transfer time, so about 20 milliseconds, um, because power has to be discontinued until there is confirmation that the relay has opened. So it's a very, very quick uh, change over. Um, of course, the inverter in this backup mode will use a grid to keep the batteries top up and charge at all times. So that's the main function. Then we have another mode, which is a support mode. And essentially in the support mode, what we're trying to do is to, to minimize the amount of energy that we take from the grid. And um, we'll have a couple of slides more, a little bit later explaining that. And, uh, and if there is any excess, this, this very same support mode can then sell energy back to the grid. Um, in order to do that, this inverter obviously needs to be able to comply with a number of IEC regulations uh, with regards to grid connection, right? Which is fully compliant. So our inverter is fully compliant in many jurisdictions around the world, the US, Canada, most of Europe, uh, Australia, imminently in South Africa, etc. So now, going into the various priority settings that the, that the inverters can actually take, um, we're going to go one by one each of them here. I think it's, it's important actually to see. So in the first one, which is priority power, um, essentially all the energy, which is produced by the solar charge controller is, um, is used before anything is taken from the grid, um, which is the most popular application of the inverters these days. Um, then the second one is actually parallel power, which is mm, less popular on the, on the third world, a lot more popular on the developed countries. Um, here we're just trying to supplement the grid at certain times of the day. Uh, so in other words, in certain parts of the world, because of the high penetration of renewable energy, you are commanded not to um, export to the grid at certain times, but as well you get penalized by consuming from the grid at certain times, like early in the morning or late in the, in the afternoon. So essentially your inverter could be able to actually flat those peaks that you have at those times of the day by using battery power. That's parallel power. Uh, your generator support, it's a, it's a close closing of a frequency regulation support. So with generation support, what we do is we assist a generator to supply a load by injecting power on the output of a generator. So uh, we can then use a smaller generator to cope with peaks. Um, so then when we're doing uh, power coupling, as we explained a couple of slides ago, um, we use active frequency shifting to be able to control devices which are um, in parallel with these inverters on the same AC bus, okay? And, and then as we explained, we're able to sell energy back to the grid with the XW plus when and if required. So, so now this is a good slide because it shows the topology of the inverters very easily. Um, there, there is two different types of inverters. Um, the more low tier types of inverters in the market um, do work on a sort of double conversion type of setup um, where the energy goes in and out of the inverter uh, via rectifier and an inverter. Um, these inverters actually do work grid tight with the grid. So where you see V1, the voltage one there on the image, there will be a relay there. Um, where you see actually I2, there will be a relay there too. 
Um, so what the inverter tries to do at all times is to manage the amount of power that it supplies to the loads by slightly changing the voltage of the connection point on V2. Okay, so the, when we have inverter on grid support, which is what, what this slide is about, um, and because it's a battery inverter, the energy is supplied to the inverter from the solar source via the DC bus, right at the bottom there on the inverter. Okay, so the inverter will keep injecting energy into the AC bus, which is the red lines on top, for as long as the battery maintains voltage above the setting. That setting we call it uh, the grid support voltage or VGS. So once we hit on this grid support mode VGS, let's say later, later in the afternoon we have no more solar generation and we start depleting our battery. Once we land on this VGS voltage, the inverter switches into the grid. Or essentially the inverter just stops injecting power into this parallel bus. Um, and, and so it does when it reaches VGS minus 0 0.5. That's the, the hard deck of the transition between uh, self-sustainability and the grid. Um, then when the inverter goes above VGS plus 0 0.5, start going back into battery and solar and then minimizes the uses of the grid. Of the grid. But, uh, but still the grid is kept available at all times so the grid can react quickly to any variations on load. Then in this mode, by the very nature of us being using the battery between full and the BGS or the grid support voltage, we are cycling the battery. Um, therefore, if we are, were had to have power outage right at the bottom of the cycle, or when our battery is right at the bottom of its charge, or BGS in this case, um, we will be left with only the amount of energy contained on the battery between the, the grid support voltage and the low voltage cutoff. So, in essence, that, that can be a lot, it can be a little, depending on what the user has set. So this is typically the mode that most people will use on, on the developing countries because power is unreliable. Um, then we have um, a version of this mode, which we call enhanced grid support mode. So in that case, um, the, the system presumes that the grid support voltage is the battery being full. So after the inverter has run three cycles and have run a full bulk and a full absorption uh, cycle on the charge, you will not anymore consume any more power from the battery and you will just purely put in the excess power of the DC bus, in other words, any energy coming from the solar panels out into the loads and will try to match the loads. So in this case, in essence, you are getting your batteries full or keeping your batteries full continuously during the whole time. And during the day, you're producing solar energy and injecting that to the loads. Uh, if we were ever lose the, the grid for whatever reason, the system reverts to a normal grid support mode and it works completely off grid and, um, and uses batteries and solar power, solar generation, solar energy to provide the loads. Um, so in this case, we're not cycling our batteries with enhanced grid support. On the previous case, we are cycling the batteries in between full and BGS, grid support voltage. Um, so this is popular as well within some of the customers as well, uh, especially customers that don't want to spend too much money on batteries and want to have a very small limited amount of, of backup time uh, in case of uh, power outage. So therefore, they got to keep that very small amount of storage that they have purchased full at all times. So then we, we go into, into some more complicated modes like the, the peak shaving type of mode. So, in this case, we can tell the inverter to supply energy from the DC bus. Remember, DC bus can be battery or battery plus solar in the case of a DC couple system. Um, to provide energy from above a threshold from your inverter. So a threshold is fully configurable. So we have an example there where we actually um, see the amount of power coming from the grid is 1550 watts. And then over and above that point, which is 6.7 amps, we have a programmable inverter to produce the extra. So in this case will be 1,210 10 watts. So we can move that point anywhere between zero to the maximum of the inverter. The maximum of the inverter is, uh, is 8.5 kilowatts. So um, it is important to understand that during any type of load shaving or peak shaving um, set up on the inverter, AC charging is, uh, is precluded. Um, because obviously the inverter works as a one-way street. It is, either it is on P mode or Q mode. So either it is supplying power or either it is charging. 
So when we are in peak shaving mode, we, we are in power production mode. So, so we are not able to charge. So you could potentially set the load shaving parameter on the inverter down to zero amps, which means that the inverter will always use all the power from the DC bulbs to supply the loads. But then that means that you have permanently disabled essentially the AC, AC recharge. So it's important to keep to keep that in mind. Okay. Um, so we have um, okay, so this is like this is a, so we have then the last um, the last mode that we're going to discuss today, which is the generator support. It's rather simple. This generator support is there to be able to assist on, on microgrids where you require to actually boost the power of a generator. Um, since a generator typically in a microgrid will want to be choose close to its maximum base load, um, it will be very detrimental to the fuel consumption of the generator and to the, the, the maintenance cost of the generator to have to size the generator two to three times bigger than what it should be for base load just to cope with the peak loads. So, and that's very clear because the generator likes to run a high loading, 70-80% for fuel consumption. So in order to be able to use a generator which base load is very close to its prime power setting, we use this kind of setup where the peaks are supplied by the inverters. So then in that case, we can have the best of both worlds. We can have a little bit of backup by the means of having battery and some PV generation. And we can have a generator that runs 24 hours very close to its peak. So, so it's a great application for people that is going to have a generator supplying the base load of micro. Okay, so, and then inverters are able to, to, to perform that function. That's what we call generation support. Um, the grid cell is a feature that is added in addition to the grid support feature, right? So in the grid support feature, we are injecting power into the red bus, that we see there. Um, we have built internally into the inverter an, an amp meter, a current meter, that allows us to see which current is going in and out of the inverter. So we are able to export, essentially. So after we have supplied all the loads, if there is any excess power, then that excess power can be routed back to the grid. Um, it can be curtailed, it can be capped. So it's a parameter into which we can actually tell the inverter the maximum it can export. Um, so this can be with or without batteries. It will not make um, PV generation on the DC side. It will not make much sense to export if we don't have any generation on the DC side. Okay, so now, once we understand what is the mode, so we can use the inverters add, which is a bit of a refresh from the previous three seminars, in, in which we actually covered this into a much deeper level of detail. Uh, we're going to get a little bit more hands-on with regards to how to use equipment, okay? So the Schneider solar equipment has been designed to be easy to use. Uh, documentation is very well put together and it's extensive. You have essentially three ways to configure your equipment. Um, it's only a few uh, operations with inverters that will require the Conex configuration tool, which I will explain in chapters now. But in general, the three of them, the Conex um, system, system control panel, the configuration tool, which is a USB to CAN adapter, or the gateway can be used for setting up the system. Okay? Um, with the Conex configuration tool, that's just a laptop tool, it's an installer tool, um, it's not for, for long-term monitoring. You can monitor the system for as long as you're in front of it with the computer. Um, the control panel doesn't allow any monitoring. It's just purely to stop parameters and clear faults. Um, the gateway allows you to do full-time, long-term monitoring, data display, reports, and configuration of equipment. So moving on, um, we're going to actually roughly see which are the, the, the important steps on, on putting together a system where most people tend to to have difficulties. So we'll speak about the communication between the devices because some sort of communication must exist in between the devices to achieve all those smart modes that we were discussing previously. Um, then we need to have as well some sort of AC synchronization in between the AC producing devices. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about how the devices identify each other, uh, configuration for one phase and three phases of inverters, and uh, we'll talk a little bit as well about energy priority voltages and currents. So, a um, bit of legacy. Um, the SANBOS is a CAM based protocol which is used for all the devices to communicate with each other. 
So as you will see there on that image on the bottom left, uh, those blue lines is essentially a communication cable that goes from one device to the next. And this is connected sequentially um, into what people in a CAN configuration will call a daisy chain. Um, as with any CAN uh, communication, you have to have terminations on both ends of the communication network. That's just to advance, uh, ab um, avoid the signals just bouncing back and creating noise on the communication. So particularly the order into which device is connected in daisy chain to which device doesn't really make a difference because as with any kind of communication system, every device has a unique number, like some sort of like your own name. So one device can send directly a message to another device just by calling its name in the message. Um, so this network requires power to run, something we're going to touch on just now. That power is produced by the communication boards inside of some of the devices. So in other words, some devices are able to produce power in the network, and some devices are only able to consume power. Um, so there is an element of planning into how many power producing devices you need to have if you don't wanna have an external power supply to provide power to the sandbox network. In general, most configurations with the right amount of inverters run perfectly well without any external power supply. So, so going back to that, um, the total length um, of, of this chain of devices that we have here is right about 30 devices. And that is because there is, a, in order to have um, a very fast polling speed, so we can have very quick control in between all the devices on the, on the, on the Sambos network, um, the, the, the bandwidth of the message that each device sends to another device is limited. So that's what actually limits the number of devices that we can have. There is a very nice guide on the Schneider website that actually explains this in a bit more detail. In that table, you can see a few examples of combinations of different numbers of devices that you have in the network before you exceed actually the network capability limits. Um, there are some physical limits as well um, in order to keep that fast communication, that bulk rate high, um, which is the length of cable, right? So we have too many devices. We got to try and keep the, the total wiring. Uh, of the system below 40 meters. Yeah? Um, so, so typically, these do not become an issue for small installations. Either one phase or three phase residential, you're looking at a handful amount of meters because the devices are just co-located uh, one next to another. Uh, this can become an issue only when we are doing much larger commercial installations. So we can see here again on the image on the bottom right, uh, a more simplified scheme the sandbox in daisy chain and the terminators on both sides of the network. Now let's talk about the power supply. So um, when we're using sandbox in between the devices, some devices as the inverters, you can see that the Connex XW Plus do generate power into a network. Uh, the solar charger as the ATM generate power into a network, but then the rest of the devices actually consume power to keep the communication going as a 60 amp charger, the comb box and or the gateway, the automatic generator to start, system control panel, battery monitor, etc. So um, if you were potentially on a situation where you didn't have an inverter, I'm going to give you an example of what that can be. Let's say that you have been hired commissioned to put together um, solar backup systems for radio stations. So typically uh, broadcasting equipment, it's all DC power. So you really don't have a need to have an inverter. You can even find DC uh, generators. So in that case, you might very well have a charger, like a 16 amp charger that do not generate any power. And that's the only device there. So if you wanted to monitor that device with a com box or a gateway or something else, we'll have to have a 12 volt power supply connected into the, into the samples. Another example is a simple installation in a house with one inverter and one charger. One Connex XW, on one MPPT 60 amps. So it's perfectly okay. One produces the power, the other one consumes the power. So it's very unlikely that you will run into trouble with the small installations. Uh, but in bigger installations, this is just an element to keep in mind to keep the CAMBOS steady. So now SAMBOS requirements, again, SAMBOS for communication network. Um, to make it simple, um, the, the the wiring is done using RJ45 connectors, which is your typical Ethernet connector. 
and we use Ethernet cable, but again, this is not Ethernet communication. So we're putting power on places where Ethernet would be putting data. So in other words, if you put Sandbox connected to Ethernet, or Ethernet to Sandbox, bad news. So the communication boards get damaged. Um, but other than that, the cable is actually wired normally, like any other network cable would be. Um, and uh, we recommend to use CAT6 cable, uh, just mostly because of the noise shielding, which is good if you have a very large Samos network, 20, 20 plus devices. Um, important to keep, while well, some people want to keep the installation tidy and the cable length only sufficient for reaching one device to the next, Again, we need to remember this is not Ethernet communication. Um, so because this is a, a type of serial communication, cables that are too short can generate issues too. So we recommend a minimum of one meter of cable in between the devices. Can be more, but at a minimum one, one meter. So, so now, after we have got the whole hurdle of, of wiring the equipment and connecting one to another, um, so success there, um, the equipment is to be configured and is to be given a, a unique identifier, a unique number. We call it a device, device instance, okay? So I've taken a few screenshots from the gateway, the gateway being our, our newest monitoring and programming platform. Um, so you can see there on the device instance box right at the bottom that we have a field which we call device number. So that device number is a numeric unique identifier that the system will use to send messages. So not to be confused, okay? I know this is a little bit confusing, not to be confused with some boss address or the boss ID. You will see that there is an image there at the top right that actually shows boss ID and some boss address. So when the system boots up by the very first time, okay, the very first device and the daisy chain will be called zero, the next one will be called one, the next one will be called two, three, four, five, so that is a logic address, okay? Your boss ID is that we can have on a system two SAM bosses working simultaneously because my data logger, my gateway, which is the one that provides this beautiful interface can actually handle two systems. So in this case, we have connected our system on the second boss. That's what it tells us. But the device number is your name, John, Peter, Keith, we, we cannot use letters, alphanumeric, we can only use numbers, but it's a unique number. That number has nothing to do with the DAISY chain. The DAISY chain can be device A, B, and C, but device A can be one, device B can be three, device C can be two. So in other words, the, the device number do not have to be on the same sequence that the DAISY chain. The DAISY chain sequence will show in the sample's address when you actually check it on the gateway, but it's not used for sending messages. The device number is used to send messages. Um, then you can add a friendly name, which is a device name, which you see on the system control panel, which is the LCD display, or you will see on the more sophisticated gateway, which is this online uh, platform to actually do monitoring and control of the system, right? So this is important because it's an easy mistake to make and it gives people a lot of headaches. Um, now, very specifically, the inverters will have two sets on the bottom of RJ45 connectors. Um, one is very clearly labeled SunBoss. We have just discussed what SunBoss is. It's a communication in between all, each and every device of the Schneider Connect uh, family of products on the system. The AC Sync port, which is a, as well an RJ45 connector, is only used to pass certain information in between inverters. So we should never connect a SunBoss cable into AC Sync or vice versa, an AC Sync into a SunBoss because we run the risk of damaging the equipment. Uh, now, we could picture a system that is very simple on having only two inverters. So that's fair enough, simple. It's only one cable going to inverter A to inverter B. So we'll have one master inverter, one slave, single phase, simplest of the simplest of the, of the systems with multi inverters, but we could have as well a system with nine inverters, into which we have three inverters per each phase. So you will wonder how should the AC sync go? Should I go master phase one, slave one, phase one, slave two, phase one, sequentially? No. You can actually just wire the AC sync from one inverter to the next. It doesn't have to be wired in any logical configuration. As long as there is a DAISY chain, 
into what which, which communicates one inverter to the next is sufficient. It could go from master one to slave phase three to, to master phase two one. So again, it doesn't require a logical order, it just requires a sequential order of one to the next. But this is very important. And failure on these cables will give a lot of trouble when the inverters actually are switching between um, grid, grid support and complete off grid support. So if you're going to be making all these uh, ACC wiring cables and the sandbox cables, considering that the cable is made like an Ethernet cable, it's good that you invest in an Ethernet cable checker. You know, those ones that you can actually you can plug on both sides of the cable and you can see you've made your connections correctly. Um, because this tends to break havoc on the installations, right? You crimp your cable, it looks good, but it doesn't work good. Okay, so checking those cables before connecting them is a must. I will use this slide as well to show you in that Zoom area where you have around Zoom, which is showing you the AC sync ports and sandbox ports. You can see as well two small connectors there. One that you might not be able to read is a white square, which is called BTS, Rabo Tango Sierra. That's a battery temperature sensor, um, which is advisable to use with lead acid applications, um, not advisable to use with lithium applications. And then we have the auxiliary port, AUX, Alpha Uniform X-ray. So this is a five pin connector, which we use for a number of applications. We'll just briefly describe them. Application one is just a, it's a dry contact. So we use two of those five pins to open and close relays to do a number of things. Switch on lights, open and close relays, send a message to an HMI, etc., etc. We have five pins because in one of the applications of the system, which I will explain later, we need to control a contactor to be able to isolate the grid uh, on the larger commercial systems, and that contactor will actually require to use those five pins. So, as after we have put to sleep the AC sync wiring. Um, I think I think I'm just gonna make a couple of comments here with regards to normal wiring of inverters and, and problems that we've seen customers experiencing. Um, since these inverters are connected essentially all in parallel to the grid and in parallel to each other, but they're in the same phase, it's crucially important not to loop from one inverter to the next when doing your electrical connections, right? So your lifeline cannot just loop your life input from the grid, just loop from one inverter to the next to the next. Okay, because that creates a different impedance on the, on the input of the grid to inverter one, to inverter two, or to inverter three. And that tends to create a severe phase um, load imbalance. So you will see there that in the, in the, in the left side of the inverter, um, right under the display is a section where all the easy connection to the inverter is, is made. And people tend to make that mistake when doing the configuration, the, the connection to the inverter. So each inverter needs to be fed by a separate cable coming from a circuit breaker. So now this is explained by understanding again the architecture of the inverters. So or, or a smaller inverter or the Connex XW, uh, SW, sorry, do not have an AC2. So you can see there on the top, uh, top left that the inverters have two inputs, AC1 and AC2. Um, only XW Plus has AC2. Um, but the logic is the same for both with regards to how they operate in parallel with the grid. Um, AC1 and AC2 are used for bringing the grid and bringing an auxiliary input, which can be a generator, into the system. Okay? Um, all the logic of the system, even though I can program AC1 to be the grid, to be a generator, or to not be used at all, and the same applies to AC2, I can program AC2 to be the grid, a generator, or nothing at all. Even though it's fully configurable, what AC1 and AC2 can be, some of the logic on the inverter, like the grid support modes, only work when AC1 is configured as a grid input. Just for simplicity, I presume when software was designed, okay? Something to keep in mind. It's not, it's not clearly described in the documentation. It can cause a little bit of confusion. The default, when you bring your inverter, take your inverter out, out of the box, is AC1 to be the grid connection, and AC2 to be the generator connection. Um, AC out is labeled clearly as well. That's where you're going to actually send your power out uh, when the grid is unavailable. So you see two relays there, and you can see a power transformer, and you can see there your bidirectional uh, rectifier inverter, if you will. So this is the main architecture. How we control the amount of power on this red bus, again, a reminder, 
by changing the voltage of the output of the power of inverter. Okay, so if we put more voltage than the voltage of the grid, we're able to inject power. If we put less, we're able to charge. So Connex actually a great little product for the residential customers, great quality. Uh, it's an inverter comes with a two years warranty out of the box. You can apply for an additional one year extra by registering the product on our uh, property registration database. Um, in South Africa, we only stock the 48 volt version um, of the inverter. Uh, the inverter is a 3.8 kilowatt inverter, so it's 4 kVA plus, depending on temperature the rating, one phase only. Okay, but it has a very interesting feature for small remote systems, which is it, it can actually charge a dead battery. You see. Um, many inverters in the market, if it is a 48 volt inverter, will not charge a battery if the battery goes below 40. Uh, while these inverters actually will charge a battery significantly more depleted than that, which can be good for a system that has been kept off for a very long period of time. So you don't need to actually have to take those batteries out and into a, a, a special charger, which is which is very good. So from the from the unboxing point of view of the inverter. You can see all the connections are actually to the left of the inverter uh, that is done on purpose because we as well supply a product which is a, a connection panel. The connection panels connect to the, to the left of the inverter so you can actually have all your DC breakers and, and, and all your input and output breakers into that box. Okay, so it sits exactly the same size as the inverter, it sits on the left. Very little to no smart display on the display. You can actually only see what the inverter is doing via the inverter light, the release passing through the power and or is producing power. You can see if the AC input is actually being qualified. When, it, when Schneider speaks about qualifying a source of energy, is that the source of energy has been verified to be within certain parameters. In the case of these inverters is that they do comply between a maximum and minimum voltage and maximum and minimum frequency. Both of them can be changed. Those windows of frequency and voltage can be modified by using the system control panel, SCP, and or by using the gateway. You have a button there, button number four, I think it's, it's very important. That button number four is used to clear faults. You will say, but why? There is certain faults that will happen on the inverter that will become permanent faults. That doesn't necessarily mean that the inverter is broken, but there is an abnormal situation that requires attention. And instead of having the inverter to continuously restart, risking damaging the equipment, it will go into standby and it will actually flash a fault. So to clear a fault using this uh, display, you just need to just keep hard press this for more than two seconds. Uh, as well, number five is like an on-off switch, not much mystery to it. So hard press more than two seconds and you will have inverter enabled, hard press two seconds, inverter disabled. Okay, so with regards to search capabilities, um, these little inverters have actually quite large surge capabilities. So you can see that this inverter can, depending on temperature, handle up to seven kilowatts of, of peak load for a very brief period of time, that's five seconds, and up to 4.4 kilowatts for 30 minutes. In our experience, it's one of our best selling products here in South Africa, um, because it does meet the requirements of 80% of our residential customers. Um, which is to keep a decent level of backup for lighting circuits and for critical plug circuits like internet, and maybe a fridge, very small power type of loads. So essentially with this small inverter, uh, with 3.8 kilowatt, uh, 4.4 kVA inverter, plus enough solar generation, the customers can be practically off grid on those circuits. Yes, if there is a power outage, they might miss a swimming pool and they might miss a few other things, but in general, their life just carries on. So that's, this is why it's a great uh, best-selling product for customers that are actually interested on, on value, value for money. Then we have the customers interested on more complicated applications or which simply require a bigger level of comfort or which want to do a commercial application which needs a bigger system. So here we have the Connex SW Plus, which is derived from the SW, it's just of size with a few extra, extra features. Um, it used to come on two models, okay, the 7048 and the 8548. Um, coming June, the 7048 has been discontinued. It's essentially a very small difference uh, of power output in between the 7048 and the 8548. We are just 
concentrating on the 8548, which is an 8.5 kilowatt inverter for 30 minutes peak. So Schneider has a very interesting way to actually rate their equipment. While most manufacturers actually zero into what is the maximum peak load the inverter can carry for five seconds, 30, 60 seconds. Schneider tries to look in the, into what the inverter can do with a 100% duty cycle. So in other words, if this inverter was doing this load 24 hours a day. So in the case of the XW Plus, it is tested by UL laboratories, 6.8 kilowatt, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So, and that is to the maximum limit of temperature that the inverter can handle. So it's a very different way to actually sell an inverter because that tells you that the manufacturer has tested what the inverter can actually do during normal real use usage, not only using the picks. So um, this inverter can go over 10 kilowatts for a fraction of, of a minute. So it's not why, why it's advertised as a 10 kilowatt. So now a bit more complicated than this of you as well internally. Um, we have uh, essentially two, two compartments from an IP perspective, okay? Actually three, three compartments from an IP perspective. Um, if you see that diagram on the left, you will see that you have the display on the top left. Uh, that compartment um, is, is, not, is not technically IP rated because it has openings on the bottom. You're gonna actually knock off, knock out those openings so you can get your winding in and out. So this is technically an IP, an IP20 um, enclosure on the left, um, because you might not actually use any any type of seal on the on the input of those cables into the into the connections into the terminals. So everything that is designed there and is installed there on that side is installed and designed to work with high humidity and dust. There's no problem there. Even the display is completely sealed, so nothing there can actually can get damaged. Then we have two compartments. One, which is at the back of the inverter, where we have a big transformer, and we have pretty much all the airflow from the fans cooling off the inverter. And then we have the power conversion part of the inverter on the front, which is where those blue capacitors are. That section is IP65. It's completely sealed. So at the back of the power conversion section, there is a plate. That plate is connected to a heat sink that goes from the IP65 uh, enclosure into the IP20 enclosure, which is the one on the back with the fans. So those fins dissipate the heat produced inside of the power conversion uh, side of the unit. So this is done in order to reduce them, the ingress of humidity and dust to the power conversion part of the unit, which is an enemy of, of the unit for, for reliability purposes. Uh, the fans are designed to be field replaceable. So a broken fan is not a train smash, can be replaced. Um, the airflow goes from the bottom to the top. Um, but logically, we want to think that the cooler air will always be on the bottom. Um, and there is a felt filter, which is uh, positioned right at the bottom of the airflow and air, air intake uh, of the fans. So this felt filter can actually be washed, it's easily washable and replaced, uh, which is very good for, for regions actually that are very, very dusty. Um, the fan, it's a, it's a variable speed fan. It operates depending on the temperature of the device. Um, it can be almost not noticeable when the device is not operating at hard load, uh, at high load. Uh, it's, it's very noticeable. It's, it's plenty of volume of air that is going through, through the inverter. So we can see in more details there on the, on the right of the slide, uh, the connections to the inverter. So they have been made in such a way that, that, that made simple and friendly to install it. So let's talk about the stuff that people always get wrong. Okay. So there is a variety of types of conversions um, when we are talking about inverters, okay? Um, but in this case, because we have an inverter that do have a transformer and quite a big one, um, we, the neutral that we use when the grid is available is the neutral of the grid. Whether or not we're consuming power from the grid, because remember, the way that we control not consuming power from the grid is by increasing the voltage to keep the current from the grid at zero. So, um, so this means that in this inverter, you do not need to bridge the output neutral to earth. Not necessary. I know that in some of the cheaper inverters that's necessary because of the double conversion takes place inside of the inverter. This inverter is not necessary. So you will say, but Luis, then how the inverter does to operate when it's an off-grid configuration? It was very simple. It does that process only 
automatically inside of the inverter when it's an off grid configuration. So, in other words, when it detects a grid failure, it will then reach the center tap of the transformer to air. If you do not need to do that, the inverter will do that for you. So, what you will do is you will connect your life, neutral, and earth coming from the municipal supply straight uh, to the grid or AC1, and your loads will be connected the same way. Life, neutral, and earth separate neutral and earth out into the distribution of water loads. Um, in the case of the generator, there is two types of generators. There are generators into which the neutral is grounded, and there are generators into which the neutral is not grounded. Um, in this case, we we are assuming that the generator has grounded the neutral at the alternator. Okay, so that's what is being considered for the AC2 input. So if it is if it is different than that, you will probably have to ground those two on the output of the generator before feeding them into the inverter. Um, we have two very sturdy DC connectors for the for the DC wiring, which you can see that they are clearly shown as red and black as well. Okay, uh, and that's it. Extremely extremely simple. Uh, we have two. We have one earth point and we have a grounding point. People tend to get confused between the two concepts. So your earth uh, point, if you will, is on the on the on the bottom right of the of the, the bottom center of the AC connection box. You will, see, you will see there right on top of where it says AC out connection, there is a little symbol there. So that is actually going to going to, to earth the box of the inverter in case of an electrical failure inside of the inverter. So the, the enclosure doesn't become hot. It's an electrocute somebody. And then you have your normal earthing or grounding bar for, for the loads and for the grid input, which is on the bottom left of the AC connection box. Um, so it's compliant with NRS 097 and with any uh, requirement of most countries which have deployed renewable energy with regards to um, electrical safety while using inverters. So the display that comes out of the box on the inverter is not as sophisticated as the system control panel. Um, it allows you to see the basic functions of the inverter, either how much power is making or how much uh, current is putting into the batteries when it's charging. Um, it will allow you to see if there is a fault, it will allow you to switch it on and off. Not really much more than that. Okay, so this is why the XW was designed from the factory for the system control panel to be used as a, as a plug-in replacement to the display. So it's fairly simple to do. The size is identical, so your system control panel is exactly the same size than the display of the inverter when it comes with the inverter. Um, so it's four screws, you unscrew the display, take the old display out, there's a cable there, you plug that cable into the system control panel. The system control panel at that point doesn't require any sort of termination because the communication between the system control panel and the inverter when the system control panel is installed to the inverter is not sandbox. So, so that cable that you're connecting to the back of the display is not operating like a sandbox connection. On the right side of the inverter, you have the main cover of the inverter. The main cover of the inverter needs to be replaced. So the rear end of that cable can be now disconnected from port one, connected to port two. When you put back the main cover of the inverter, and you fasten the four screws on the SCP in the place where the previous whole display was. That's it. Now that SCP, system control panel, if you will, you might call it the super display, is able to control the whole system because via the inverter is able to communicate to every one of the devices on the sandbox chain. So from the system control panel, of which you need only one per system, you can now set up every single device, clear faults, do all the operations that you require. And on top of that, you can get display of the production of the system, meters, etc. Et so in other words, when you buy the SCP, it does come with a mounting bracket. So you can mount the SCP standalone. I don't know, maybe on the living room, somewhere remote from the equipment, right? So you don't want to have to be walking all the way to the garage maybe to see what the inverter is up to. So you can put this uh, system control panel anywhere where you, where you want it, right? So maybe in the kitchen, you can cut it out in the kitchen cupboard and just put it there. But if you want to have it with the equipment, you can then replace one of the inverter, XW inverters displays with the control panel. This is specific to the XW Plus inverter. Okay, so, 
same than the SW, the XW has an even bigger search capability. Um, so as you can see there, the inverter can ramp for 60 seconds up to 12 kilowatts. So the competition would probably say that this is a maybe 12 kVA inverter uh, with a power factor of one. Uh, we do call it an eight and a half kilowatt inverter. Uh, so because it can do eight and a half kilowatt by 30 minutes, right? So this is all temperature dependent. As you know, the Achilles heel of any power conversion device is temperature of the power conversion equipment, the IGBTs. Um, so the hotter they get, the quicker they fade. So obviously this is what defines these limits of, um, of power versus time. Um, now let's talk about some limitations on the equipment um, and how we get around those limitations, okay? Every inverter which operates with relays, um, whether they are mechanical relays or whether they are solid state relays, a relay has a maximum current limit. So since our inverter essentially operates in parallel with the grid, that means that um, essentially when we're going on a pass-through mode, um, all the power is going to be going through all the relays on the path of the power between the input and the output of the inverter. The relays on board of the XW process are rated to 60 amps. 60 amps and 230 volts per phase. That's roughly 12 kilowatts. Now you could say if we have two inverters in parallel and our load is bigger than 60 amps, right, and we need to switch in between grid and inverter and back from inverter into grid, you could say, well, that should not be a problem because I have two inverters, I should be sharing the load in between them, therefore each relay will only see half of the load. But that is not correct because when we actuate uh, a mechanical device, there is a small lag time on the actuation. Very, very small, but it does exist. So for a fraction of a second, one of the inverters is going to be taking all the load. So um, that can cause the risk of welding shut, welding closed. The, the contactor, and if you weld the contactor, well, you disable the inverter because the contactor is a, a, a fundamental safety device for the operation of the inverter. Remember, your inverter needs to comply with quick grid disconnection in the event of an outage. So, and the only way to do that is by having disconnected relays. So, if your relay breaks, the relay needs to be replaced. The unit is out of commission. So, this is why, even if you have two inverters per phase, we will only plan each phase up to 60 amps if we want the power to go through the inverter. In other words, power to go in, power to go out. Um, now, there is a way around that for the larger systems, okay, into which we use the grid input as a load output. So as you will see here, our load is on the AC one side of the circuit. Uh, it's not on the AC output. So in other words, our inverter is either charging or producing power. So where will it be in this case or, or external power supply? Or where, where our OPV will be? Depends. The master inverter can actually control the contactor that you see there, just by where it says good AC. There is a box there that's actually the icon of a contactor. That contactor can be physically open by one of the inverters. Therefore, you can still use power from the DC bus and export that power via AC1 into the loads. So you can run perfectly off-grid. And in this case, if we need the grid to bypass because we exhausted our batteries, so this at night, right? And we need the grid to go, and the grid is more than 60 amps per phase. As you see, by closing that contactor, the power is not going anymore through the inverters, it's going straight to the loads. So by doing this, we remove completely the, the, the issue of having a maximum rating on the relays going through each inverter. So typically this is reserved for bigger systems. Um, so 12 kilowatts times three phases, you're looking there, 36 kilowatts. So I would say anything above probably 30 kilowatts requires an external contactor and a different topology, which is what we're seeing here. Uh, now, uh, to put all of you that are worried now about, um, you know, if we could actually do an AC couple system on this configuration, uh, the inverter is able, the master inverter, it's smart enough to know that the contactor is open or closed and will allow to do frequency shifting or frequency control on AC1 too. Because logically, the frequency is produced on the inverter. The inverter is in parallel on that bus that supplies AC output and AC1. 
So we can do frequency shifting both on the input and the output of the inverter. So in this example, in this picture, we could plug a very huge, large PV grid tire inverter on the load side and just use that as a source of supply of solar energy. Okay, so on the, on the AC side, where it says good AC, we can have a grid, but we could have a generator too. So again, to recap this section, which is extremely important, we have a hard line of systems that consumes less than 60 amps per phase and more than 60 amps per phase. Uh, I will touch on that a little bit later, but the maximum that we can configure uh, Connex XW is 72 kVA. So you can build a fairly large system using these inverters. Okay, so now um, that explains very much the next slide where we can go from very little in a house, which is uh, 3.8 kVA all the way to 70 plus kVAs by using what Schneider calls a cluster. Uh, they're, they're reminding us here when we have many inverters not to forget uh, the AC sync cable and the AC sync port. It's a good, good reminder, okay? So now, um, everything you see here comes from very detailed documentation. So this comes from the multi-unit power systems design guide, which is great, it's excellent. It tells you what to expect into each of the possible configurations that you can have. So you can have up to six configurations, roughly speaking, um, of which you can have three on single phase. You can have essentially three on three phase. Um, going all the way to 34 kVA on one phase, and going all the way to 76.5 kVA on three phases. Very possible to integrate generators uh, when both as a backup, when we're using a single phase system, and as base load when we're using a three phase system or backup as well in a three phase system, okay? We will be circulating this guide as well because I think it's, uh, it's the, the, the piece of resistance for, for the design of these very large systems. Um, here we have an, ex an example when we are actually using an external contactor. And, and I'm going to ask you, please, not to get into mission overload here, because it's quite a busy, it's a, it's quite a busy graph chart. Um, but it's quite simple to understand, okay? So in this configuration, in this case, we have a three-phase microgrid, okay? All our, phase, uh, all our loads are three-phase loads. We're going to assume that the load is big enough let's say in this case that this load is 60 kilowatts, then the phases are well balanced. And that could be a completely different seminar into why the, the, the loads per phase should be balanced. But let's assume that they're very well balanced. Um, our power supply or input, or energy input, is coming from a grid tire inverter, which is sitting right there at the top of the image. Uh, we have supplementary input as well, which is coming via the DC side, which is your MPPT charge controllers right at the bottom of the image. Then we have three inverters per phase. You can see that we have an A phase, a B phase, a Bravo phase, and a C phase, a Charlie phase. In each phase, we have one master and two slaves. So we have master phase A, slave one phase A, slave two phase A. Then every single one of the inverters on each phase is in parallel, supplying that one phase via the AC one, via the input. As before, this is a system for more than 60 amps. So what's gonna happen here is when the grid is available, but you see there that the icon shows as well as generators. So in this case, when the AC input, or the AC source, sorry, is available before the contactor, before the external contactor, the master inverter on each of the phases will use small wire connected upstream the contactor to sense voltage. So AC1 on each of the inverters, master A, master B, and master C, will be seen if phase A has 230 volts to neutral, and phase B has 230 volts to neutral, and so forth. When the three of them agree that the power is good in all three phases, they will give a signal to the auxiliary output, which is that small five pin connector on the master of line A to trigger the contactor to close. So in other words, when the three masters agree that the grid or the AC source is okay, they will command the contactor to close. When the contactor close, the inverters will all revert into charge mode. So we'll top up your battery and your grid tire inverter, which is the big inverter on the top, will supply the loads in parallel with the grid, okay? What happened if for whatever reason the grid fails? 
same thing. The three master inverters are going to notice that the voltage and the frequency has failed in each of the phases or one of the phases, and they will trigger the external compactor to open. At that point, the inverters goes from charging to power mode. So they go from Q to P, and they start producing power in parallel with the grid pair inverter that you have there, with the PV array you have there on top, and supplying the loads. Okay, for your loads, the transfer time is zero in this point, okay, when you're using an external compactor. Um, still, your MPPT charge controller will be able to contribute in this scenario when we're completely off grid, because the inverter will not see the production of power out into this AC bus as an export. So it will just produce power from the, from the charge controller for as, as much as required and necessary. So this is typically the type of installations that we do on commercial systems. So this, is, this could very well be a small hotel, a big restaurant, or, or an office, big office, right, 60 kilowatts. Um, the system can be made very smart. You can have an automatic generator starter. So for example, we could superimpose to this example um, the case that the AC source is not the grid but a genset. So then one of the masters doesn't have to be any of the, uh, sorry, one of the inverters doesn't have to necessarily be a master. Uh, we'll be monitoring the battery voltage and we'll trigger the generator to start when the battery voltage reaches a critical point. At that point, the generator will start. Again, we will supply voltage and frequency upstream the contactor. The masters will see that, will close the standard contactor, will allow power to come in, the inverters will go into charge mode, top of the batteries while the loads are being supplied by generator and the PV inverter. Once the batteries uh, reach the point of stopping the generator, the generator gets stopped. The master inverters see the drop in the voltage before the external contactor, contactor opens, the system continues working off grid. So fantastic neat solution for an off-grid system. Okay? So this is the application for the external contactor. It can be done three phase, but it can be done as well single phase. Eh? So in the case that you have 34 kilowatt uh, single phase application, you will just have uh, one third of this display. You will only have the line on the, on the face of uh, phase A, for example. So now that we have learned about that, um, the, the Schneider system comes fully kitted to be an integrated system, both from software and from hardware point of view. So there are certain accessories that we sell to make the system a very neat, compliant and safe installation. So one of them is the wiring boxes that you see there below the inverters. Okay, so those rectangular boxes you see below is what we use to actually um, trace all the wiring of the system, both um, DC and AC wiring and communication wiring in between inverters, right? So it's out of the way. And then we have what we call the PDP, it's a power distribution panel. We have a DC combination box there, with 250 amp circuit breaker, and, and sufficient uh, 12 millimeter uh, stainless steel bolts to be able to parallel all the DC power supplies. And then we have a top row where we can actually have in mounted uh, AC hardware. So we can very much do all the combination of our system inside of the PDP. So our system, a three-phase system, will look exactly like that picture that you have there, or it will look exactly for a single-phase uh, single system like the picture you have below. For the SW, which is our, our smaller offering, exactly the same. We have a, a, a P, mini PDP, which we connect to the left of the, of the system, and we use as well to do all our DC combination and, and so forth. Okay, so, so it's quite, quite important. So now I'm going to just quickly switch here to the right field here to a completely different topic, which is how to use our equipment with lithium batteries, because I know some of you are eager and, and may have seen some of these slides on previous uh, conferences. I'm just going to go through them from a, from a configuration point of view, usage, design point of view. Um, lithium batteries have particularities, most of them into the good side of things. Um, one of the most let's call it negative, um, is that compared to a lead acid battery has current range that is much more restrictive, right? So a lead acid battery has a very big envelope of current from normal operation to many times, many multiples of uh, orders of magnitude of normal operation in current. Lithium doesn't have that. So we have to have a way to either have or master controller to control the battery or the battery to control the master controller or to have no control but to have settings such that in the worst case scenario, the solar system is not able to overcome the battery. 
Okay, so in this sense, we were making the difference in between the systems that operate on closed loop and the systems that operate on open loop. It is not true that you cannot operate an open loop system efficiently and correctly. Surely you can, okay, because you're, you're doing that continuously um, when you're using your, your cell phone. Your cell phone is on charger inside that regulates what it goes inside. So, in our case, we just need to understand how the, the, the charge cycle on the inverter works, okay? So, all Schneider inverters come preset from the factory to be able to operate on two or three stages, okay? So, one being the bulk charge, next one absorption, next one flows. Uh, now, lithium batteries really do not need um, a flow charge in order to, to, to continue staying fully charged. Uh, being the reason that, in general, the BMS inside of your lithium battery, so for people that do not know, um, all lithium modules, because lithium can have something called a thermal overrun, um, and can cut fire, have protection, electronic protection inside of the battery module itself. So the battery will strive at not keeping the cells inside of the battery at 100% instead of charge all the time, because that generates a stress in the, inside of the battery. So even if you charge a battery full to the brim, the BMS will self-balance the cells to a point that they get a little bit below full. So you never, 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 never are gonna get to full. The kilowatt hour calculator is calculated to the point into which a BMS will land after it's balanced the cells below the stress point. So because of that, the battery will not benefit from flow charge, okay? Um, therefore, the way that we operate with these batteries is with the inverters on a two-stage uh, charging model. We do use the solar charges on a three stage purely because the solar system will use the three stage as a way to keep the solar charger on, but it will not overcharge a battery. So once the battery has done the two stages, which are programmed on the, on the battery inverter, then the rest of the power from the DC charger will go to the loads, or it will not be produced at all. So that's what we call an open loop, um, if you will, an open loop uh, collaboration. So the maximum volt charge voltage that we set on the batteries is below what the, the maximum control of VMS as a specific battery can handle. And the maximum current that we set is below the maximum balancing that the VMS of the specific battery can do. So in other words, we rely on the specific safety hardware built into the battery to do the balancing and the control of the battery. And in order not to overwhelm the system inside of the battery, we use parameters which will never overwhelm, overwhelm these controls. So in other words, like in these very popular times, we're flattening the curve. So we're making sure that we're always behind of what the BMS inside of your battery can do. So this is one way to do it. There is thousands of lithium battery manufacturers. There is one coming out every day. So it's not possible to pair up every single manufacturer to the inverter. Now, I said that, um, this is a couple of settings here that, you know, with different brands of batteries that we have tested on the field and work really well. So we deployed hundreds of GCL batteries uh, using Snyder Connect, no problems. So we have there the settings that actually work really good with the BMS inside of those batteries. Um, in the US, the Simplify is actually quite popular. This is light as well, it comes from there. So you have some settings there. Now, this is if we are operating an open loop. And again, an open loop, we are giving the BMS inside of the battery, the battery management system, less work. We're letting the BMS to actually operate with a certain margin. Now, there is certain other brands of batteries, which I think are gonna make you very happy, um, which will be compatible with the XW Pro, which is the big brother of the XW Plus. That inverter will be only available to us probably in Q3, maybe Q4, depending on how the pandemic progresses. Um, in this case, we have a closed loop communication. So in other words, um, these four batteries, Pylon Tech, um, Weco, uh, BYD, and soon GCL, have collaborated directly with Schneider in order to make sure that the BMS of their master battery is able to talk to our gateway. You can see that little drawing on the right. You can see uh, dotted lines that says scan and sandbox. The device there in between is our gateway. The gateway is our main communication module. So, yes, so you will deploy and play once the XW Pro is deployed. Once the XW Pro is deployed, you just need to connect your Palantec battery to our gateway and from our gateway, 
pretty much again, we will send all the commands via sandbox to all the devices. So with that, now the BMS on the battery can give an accurate value of the state of charge to the gateway, which in turn can tell all the devices to reduce the current, which is using to charge a battery, to slow down the charge rate to such point that you can actually effectively take the battery all the way to 100%. Um, and as well, you'll be able to probably deep, uh, drain the battery a little bit deeper as well, because now you have accurate state of charge calculation. So, um, unfortunately, this is not as of yet available for our market. This is only available for the UL market, which is the US, but it will be available to us this year. That's, that's for certain, that's for sure. Um, now, let's talk a little bit, uh, whatever. Unfortunately, I cannot show you in a webinar how to do the configuration with the SCP. It will require a camera and a real life system, a little bit complicated logistics. Um, but everything that you're going to see now when we actually demonstrate the, the functionalities of a gateway can be done by hand using the system control panel. So every option in the system control panel is on the gateway and vice versa. Okay? Very few exceptions there. Um, what is important for you to know is that in order to be able to fully configure your system, you need to be able to access the advanced features of the configuration. In order to do so, you need to press those three buttons on the left simultaneously, just one big hard press, two seconds, until the advanced features are enabled. So once the advanced features are enabled, then you have a number of menus that are going to pop up on the, on the SCP interface. And it's going to allow you to do full, complete configuration of your system. The only thing you cannot do with the SCP is do the voltage calibration, okay? Um, which is something that is advisable to do when we have a large system. I will talk about that a little bit later. For that, you need a configuration tool. You need your laptop, the configuration tool, and connect to equipment directly. Um, okay, so let's carry on here. So I will demonstrate this in real life just now from a gateway, but uh, Essentially, these are the main settings that actually have to be set on the inverters and the charge controllers for everything to work at, at unison, right? So um, if you're gonna use lithium batteries, you will probably be using a custom type of battery. Even though on the drop-down menu, there is an option that will allow you to select lithium, that lithium is the option that you will select when you have one of those batteries that work on closed loop, like Pylon Tech or, y, or, or BYD, or, or GCL in the future. So that is gonna tell the inverter to surrender control to the gateway so the gateway can talk to your batteries, right? So if you're gonna use lithium on an open loop configuration, so in other words, no communication between the batteries and the inverter, you need to select custom. So you, you can customize um, all the different voltages of charge and you can customize as well all the different currents. Um, so you can set up the battery capacity in amp powers, right, for your total battery bank. Um, the, the, the charging current is set in a very interesting way. Instead of just setting 10 amps or 20 amps or 30 amps, it's set as a percentage of the maximum charging current the inverter can do. In the case of the 8548 model, it can do 140 amps, which is the example you have there. So you select 70, um, if you select 50%, you will be selecting essentially 70 amps. If you select 100%, you will be selecting 140 amps. Um, as well, you can select if it is two stage or three stage. Um, as we discussed, um, when we are using lithium batteries, the battery inverter will be set on two stages, but the solar charges will be set on three stages. Um, the recharge voltage is relevant because that's the point at which the inverter will actually go and access AC1 and start recharging your batteries from the grid. Uh, once the charging cycle starts, it doesn't stop. So you need to think very carefully at which point you want the AC1 actually to kick in and to work as backup if you're actually interested in using, reducing the usage of the grid. Um, you can set up the priority of AC1 to be grid and or generator. We touched on that earlier. Um, of course, if you make AC1 generator and AC2 grid, which is the opposite of what the slide says, you are disabling some functionalities of the grid support mode. So I do not recommend that you, you do that. Um, it is important if you plan to use the load shaving and the peak shaving features that you set your AC breaker to the right size. So you will say, are you talking physically? And I will say, no, it's a parameter that is set inside of the inverter. 
So you're telling the inverter physically what's the size of the breaker that you are going to install to feed the inverter power from AC1 and from AC2. So it has to be a realistic value, a near value as close as possible to the value that you have chosen. Okay. Um, grid support voltage is something that we discussed uh, previously, right? This is very important for the grid support modes to decide at which point we go back to the grid and which point we go back to battery and back to solar, solar production. And your low battery cut out, right? So at some point your inverter is going to have to stop, right? So we don't want to damage your batteries. This is particularly important if you're using lithium batteries because you see your lithium batteries are like similar to a car into which your battery can get so low that they might require a jump start. Not the same as a lead acid battery. So your lithium batteries can get to a point that is so low that the BMS might, the BMS inside of the battery might trigger the relays inside of the battery to disconnect. And, and then if left in that condition for very long, and because of the hysteresis process inside a battery, you might get to a point that you might not be able to close those relays again other than by just logging into your battery directly with your battery software and lowering the limits of the battery to re-enable the battery again. So that's why you want to cut the power discharge from the battery to the inverter at a point a little bit above this point into which you enter into a permanent protection of the battery because that requires rescue. That requires you as an installer going to the customer site to actually have to go and log in into your batteries and lowering those protections to get the batteries to restart and take charge, which is not ideal. So it really has nothing to do much with the Snyder equipment, it's just, just a loose thought with regards to modern technology and, and how this plays out with lithium, lithium batteries. Um, so now, after we've seen these different settings, um, there's some important considerations um, and as I said in the beginning, the, this short webinar do not replace um, proper study of the documentation of the, of the inverters. Um, you do still have to go and, and actually study the documentation because equipment is powerful and have many features. But what we've noticed, okay? So, because these inverters can be configured in a number of different ways and a number of different equipment can be pulled together to make a system. There is not one parameter, which is something that it's a bit of a shame, something that uh, we have requested Snyder to change, but this is the way it is at the moment. There is not a single maximum charge rate for the system. So if you have three inverters and two chargers, the maximum charge rate to the battery will be the sum of each of the individual maximum charge rates that you have set on each of the devices. Uh, again, you have to be careful not to overwhelm your battery. If you have a 100 amp hour lithium battery, and the battery is designed to operate at 0.5 C for charge, that means that the battery should never see more than 50 amps going in. So that means that the maximum charge rates that you have scheduled in all your connex devices in the network should not add up to more than 50 amps. So it's very important. So we, we have requested to have a, a master parameter to control that. Um, still, you need to understand uh, energy priority for charge. In the solar system, you want to have solar to have priority. So there is no way to set a maximum rating for the whole system without hurting one source of charge. So typically, the one that will suffer will be the AC charge. You will leave your solar chargers at a maximum rate, and you will reduce your, your AC chargers to a point into which, if your worst case scenario were to happen, which is to recharge your batteries from the grid and from solar on the middle of the day, were to happen, you don't overcurrent your batteries. Uh, and why that can happen? Well, that's very simple. Uh, what if you have a power outage at six in the morning and your loads are actually more than, uh, than, than your solar production and the grid comes back at 12, 11.59. So at that point, probably you will have discharge your batteries to a point that you're below the AC recharge point. So your AC charges start working because the grid is back. Well, so is your solar charger, right? So at this point, you could potentially see, um, you know, extra current or overcharging in your batteries. So in the case of the lithium example, it's important to make sure that you have a clear view of what is the maximum charge rate that the whole system can put on the battery line. Um, as well, for people that actually is very interesting on exporting, I mean, I am aware in some markets export is a very, very important part of the game of having these inverters. Um, the setting that you put on AC1, okay, is what is going to be used as the maximum, um, I'm talking AC1 breaker, 
it's going to be your maximum export current. So in other words, if you by mistake don't go and change the parameter uh, and you don't see your inverter exporting as much as you were hoping, expecting, it might be that you have not modified that AC1 breaker, right? So you have told this the inverter to export, let's say, I don't know, 100 amps, whatever inverter can allow you to do, but you have not moved this AC1 breaker setting from 30. So then you're curtailing your export to 30. So there is another important one, not so clearly explained in the documentation, okay? Uh, grid support parameters, fundamentally, you understand how this works, okay? So the inverter is grid tied with the grid, even if it is not drawing power from the grid, when it's between grid support voltage and full battery. So it's battery voltage what commands the behavior of the inverters. In the drainage process, when the inverter reaches grid support voltage less 0.5, it will switch immediately to recharge if the grid support, uh, if the recharge voltages have been set above the grid support voltage, and it will pass all the loads into the grid. When the inverter records above grid support voltage, it will stop that cycle and will start again, curtailing the consumption from the grid and using power from the DC bus, from the battery PV, PV sources. Okay, another configuration that is very typical, okay? Um, it, and it doesn't happen in a single phase that often, it happens a lot in a three-phase system. So we cannot have a three-phase system, let's say with three inverters, phase one, phase two, phase three, or phase A, B, and C. And we can have different associations on the inverter. So in other words, we cannot have one inverter having uh, grid one, another inverter having grid two, another inverter having grid three. Because when we're talking about associations, we're not talking about phases. We're actually talking about sources of energy. Okay? So instead of grid one, we could call it ESCO or SESCO or any, you know, any, any grid company. Okay? So it is very important that load and grid remain the same. Okay? But battery bank cannot be different on a three-phase system either. So battery bank needs to be the same as well. If you do not do this, and you go battery one, battery two, battery three, grid one, two, three, load one, two, three, you will get something called F69, F66 when you try to set your system to operation. Um, again, not so clearly explained on the documentation. They explain how the association needs to be done, but they don't tell you what happened. So this is something to keep in mind um, because it's a very common fault on, on the configuration of three-phase systems. Now, on the same way that I told you the device ID in the sandbox is like the name of the device, right? So Luis, or Peter, John, Keith. Um, there is a preset convention of names or numbers in this case when we're using a three-phase system. So which you have on that small table there. So if we're gonna have a three-phase system, uh, the master of phase one should be 10, the master of phase two should be 20, the master of phase three should be 30. Uh, that tells the sandbox that we're actually using a three-phase system. So then it's going to look for 11 and 12, 21 and 22, and 31 and 32. Okay, so these do not apply to a single-phase system. A single-phase system, the master can be 3, and the slave can be 8, and the second slave can be 15. Absolutely no, no difference there. Okay, but 10, 11, 12, 20, 21, 22, and 30, 31, and 32 are reserved for three-phase applications, right? So something as well important to keep in mind. What happens if you don't do this? You get a configuration error when you actually power up the system and you take it from a standby to operation and F66. So now you know where you're getting the F66. It's fairly simple to, to troubleshoot. Okay, so load sharing and multi-unit configuration. Um, this is very state-of-the-art equipment. And obviously, this operation is an operation that to be done needs to be done carefully. Um, which is the balancing of the loads in between the inverters, but you can physically fine tune the output voltage of the inverter. And why I'm saying that? Because while the inverters do come pre tested and pre configured from factory, and the voltage on the no load will be 230 on the dot, once you have put impedance into the circuit, and depending on the differences on impedances in between the different inverters, you know, physical locations, you will have different voltages. And because voltage is what drives actually the load sharing, so the inverter that has the bigger voltage will have the bigger share of the load, um, it is important that all the inverters are calibrated in a multi-inverter configuration close to the same voltage. This process is done both with no load 
and then on the load. To do that, unfortunately, you need to have the configuration tool, which is a USB to Sandbox adapter. It's essentially a cable with a module you connect in your laptop, and then you connect into the Sandbox uh, to communicate to the devices. It's a very simple process and it utilizes a configuration tool software as well that runs on Windows, um, which is free to download from the website. The tool is not free though. You, um, as an installer, if you plan to be a professional installer of Snyder, at a minimum, you should invest uh, on a configuration tool. Right? Um, but it's a, it's a fairly important um, um, task that needs to be done when we have multi-unit configuration. Uh, I'm going to show you everything about the gateway now. It's a full intent to show you one real life gateway, so an operation. So it's just important for you to know um, that the gateway, which is that device, um, and you can see the picture there, communicating to the inverters and to a meter, the, the RS485, uh, is essentially, in a nutshell, a data logger. And it works as a Modbus converter. So it is able to connect to an uh, Ethernet network and is able to take uh, Modbus commands, and Modbus polling. That's for the people out there, which is very PLC oriented. So there is Modbus tables here for, for being able to send commands and draw information from the gateway, which in turn is getting the information via Sandbox from the devices. Uh, but you can have as well non-Sandbox devices connected to this uh, box, this gateway. Uh, an example is a meter. So you can have an RS-45 meter connected to it. Um, another example is uh, a grid type type of inverters, like the CL family of inverters from Schneider. Uh, another example would be your lithium batteries. If you have lithium batteries, which are part of the closed loop um, control program that the company has, has put in place to, to have closed loop control with some lithium batteries. So you have a few examples. Um, the gateway is Wi-Fi, so it doesn't really require a wide connection to connect to the customer network. So it can communicate to the customer network uh, using Wi-Fi, um, but as well do have an Ethernet port, which, which is a bit more reliable and quicker. So great features. The last and more important feature is that the gateway uh, fits once connected to the internet data to our cloud application, which we call CI2. So there is a web page into which we're able to see what the system is doing remotely. And we're able to change and, and, and see what parameters are being set on each of the devices on the system, on the sandbox, um, which I think is a quantum leap for remote troubleshooting control and all of these kind of things, okay? So now, without further delay, we're gonna actually change the share here. And we're going to see the um, real life view of one of these devices, okay? So what we have here is uh, we're connecting directly to a gateway via a VPN. So we have actually created a tunnel here between our offices and this installation site. So you will not be able to see this in real life. This is what you will see if you were connected to this customer home network or what you will see if you were connected directly to the gateway on site, you know, one, one meter away if you will from it. Okay, so this is the display of the gateway, what we call the, the, the digital HMI. So this system is configured on grid support mode. So you can see there that the inverter is very quickly changing the voltage um, on the AC bus to try and keep the grid at zero. Um, minimum resolution for, for display is 0, 0 0.1. Okay, so then continue with the explanation. You have here on the left um, your solar charger. And in this case, we're well, producing 3.9 kilowatts live. Um, you have your battery being, you know, being charged at the moment and you have your loads. So this, what we have here is what the customer will see with the user account. So let me talk about accounts here for a second. So the, the gateway has three sets of accounts. One is diagnostics, one is admin, one is user. Uh, the three of them comes with default passwords from the factory, that comes on the instructions. Uh, the three of them has to be configured and reset to a different password. Why? Because of cybersecurity requirements from Schneider. So this device will only broadcast to the cloud if the user account and the admin account have both been uh, reset to a different password than the factory password. Okay. Now your user, okay, if you're going to install this, um, sometimes it's not excellent to give access to the end user if it's not a qualified end user to all the technical uh, features of the gateway, we'll see this display and we'll have access to all the energy reporting on the platform. 
Well, if you log in as an admin, which is what we have done now, you will have access to this tab, which is your devices tab. So in this devices tab, you can see we have a full view of our devices connected into the system. The system has two inverters and has two chargers, as you can see, two ATM chargers. And I'm able to see them per family. As you can see there, inverters and chargers, charge controllers, or I'm able to see them all. We're able to see them as a list as well. We're able to see them as icons. What is most important, which I'm not able to exercise because it's a, it's a real life system, we can set the whole system to operate in order to stand by just by using this section of the interface. So let's just dive in here a little bit on the master inverter. So the first thing that we have here is a full, complete and accurate display of what the, the three sources of energy of this inverter are doing. AC1, AC2, AC load. You can see as well some important information if you are interested in Modbus communication, which is the Modbus addresses. Um, you can see temperatures, you can see currents, you can see voltages, you can see all the instantaneous information. Then we have a more friendly graphical display for this device. We can actually see a number of variables, which we see here on the legends. We see energy in, we see energy out, AC in, AC out, load, etc., etc. Right, so we can even change here the display to see. And the beauty is that this is specific to this device. The end user will not have access to this if he only has access to a user account, but the admin will have access to all of this. Okay, so you can see it per hours, per days, per months, etc. etc. Then we can have a list of events here, right? And, and what is happening here with this system, right? So we can see here little bit of load sharing. So this is AC input on the voltage. And we have see here the battery is reaching a low voltage alarm. You know, so you can see a whole history of the system there for this specific device. Um, I'm just gonna go to configuration now and I'm gonna save it for the last because we're gonna spend some time there. Um, for us as a distributor, we'll be able to actually change the grid code on the device. Uh, the grid code of the device is what tells the device uh, what frequency voltage needs to produce, what's the maximum minimum frequency, maximum minimum voltage, uh, time to reconnect, ripple, a number of parameters, right? So with a secret password, we're able to actually change this from grid code of South Africa to grid code of Germany. Firmware can be upgraded by using the gateway as well, just by having the file, um, the, the software files, the firmware for all the equipment, all the releases are available on the Schneider Electric uh, website, Schneider Solar, sorry, and it can be upgraded using the gateway and your laptop. At the moment, I'm using my laptop as if I was inside of this home network. Now we go to configuration. So you have two tabs, a basic configuration and advanced configuration tab. Um, from top to bottom, we can see here there is a number of things that we can do in the control section, right? So we will reboot or reset to factory the inverter. Be careful with this feature because in any of all cases, it will disable the power production from the system. And if you're doing this remotely, like I'm doing it now, we might lock ourselves out while the system is off. Not a great idea. Things that we can do remotely is we can actually clear things. So we can clear active faults, we can clear active warnings, we will clear all the events log, which is not a good idea. You always want to keep all those faults loaded in there just for historical reference, right? You can force things. You can force the inverter to charge. You can force the auxiliary output contact to close if you're testing that dry contact to see if it works, right? You can set the one device to standby if you want. You want to set the whole system with one device. You can do all of that. Here in inverter settings is that you set um, essentially your battery cutout and you set your, your, the rest of your, your settings with regards to the battery. So, you will see here we're running in between 47 and 65, for example. Let's change these to 48, right? So we just have to go and apply it. Okay, it will turn green. That means the inverter is taking the command. So we can go here and we can bring it back to 47. Very good. So you can see here pretty much all and every one of the battery related cutout and maximum voltages. And now, very unfortunately, on the, on, and it's something that is going to be improved on the gateway, on the system control panel, you have a function called cascading. So when you enable cascading on the system control panel, and you change 
this on inverter A, it will change it on every single device on the system that is of the same type. So if you put here 47, it will go to every single inverter on the system and it will make it 47. So that's what we would call cascading. Um, it's something that is not yet available on the gateway. It's, it's, we have requested it, so it's only once. Um, another one important is the hysteresis when using lithium batteries. This system has lithium batteries. So it is very important to know what the hysteresis is on your battery pack from your battery supplier. In this case, it's one volt. Um, I would not think that a new lithium battery will have much more than one volt when it's new. Um, when the battery is all three, four years, yes, it will start degrading a little bit. We get up to, to one and a half maybe, um, but it doesn't suffer of the big voltage drops that typically a lead acid battery um, has. That's why if you were doing this application with a lead acid battery, you would not be good by doing or using one as hysteresis. You would want to use two, for example, or, or higher, depending on how old the batteries are. Next step is where we actually set up our charger settings. As I mentioned, lithium battery, we're using a custom mode. We have disabled equalization of the battery because that could destroy potentially the battery. You can see here that in this system, we have a very low charge rate for the AC chargers and inverters because we want to guarantee and make sure that uh, if we had to have AC charging together with the two 80 amp invert um, solar chargers that we have, we don't damage the batteries. Um, you can see here that we're able to set bulk uh, voltage, we're able to set, set our absorption. Float is irrelevant in this context because as you can see here, it's two stage, but it still needs to be set up to the very same number that we are going to set up on the MPPT. That because of the logic of the system when on grid support mode. So I'm going to repeat that again. When we're using solar charges and we're using lithium batteries, even if we set the battery inverter to two stages, we still want to set the float voltage to the right voltage and to the voltage that we are going to use on the solar charger. Okay, that's very specific to the grid support modes. Here you have your parameter to decide when the inverter will be starting the recharge, right? In our case, our recharge voltage is below our grid support voltage. So in theory, our system never recharges from AC. It only recharges from AC if we have power outage that drops the voltage to a level, okay? Absorption time, you will see very short because these batteries do not require a long absorption charge. Okay, and this is something which is very specific to the uh, idiosyncrasy of every um, lithium battery supplier. In the case of these batteries, these batteries do require time to self-balance the cells inside of the modules. Therefore, if we continue charging forever, two, three hours, we are not letting space and time for the battery packs to balance themselves. And then you end up having mismatches of voltages in between modules and eventually start triggering protections. So one of the recipes of happy lithium battery ownership is not to be too excessive with absorption time because we're an open loop. So we need to let the internal controls inside of the batteries to do the job. Again, if we wanted to charge our batteries, well, we didn't want to charge them from the grid during specific times, we can set up a block start and block end, block stop. So during that period of time, we will not be touching the grid to charge our batteries, okay? So let's just minimize here a little bit this screen. Just going through some of the few settings here. I'm gonna just go to some important ones. So remember that I showed you before how we set up the name of the devices, right? So device number, this is how you set it on the gateway. On the SCP will be inside of multi-unit configuration on the system control panel. But in the gateway, you will find it on its own menu, which is this device instance menu, okay? For remote communication, outside communication, this is how you actually change the mod, mod bus address of the device. This is a multi-unit system, so we have a master and a slave. And this is the section where you actually select if you're gonna have single phase master or single phase slave or any of the variations you can have there. Now, very few countries in the world uses split phase. We are not using split phase in South Africa, that's for sure, okay? So just to avoid um, damaging the equipment because it is on the grid code, in order not to modify too extensively the firmware, it is on the South African grid code software version of the inverter, but it should not be selected, the split phase is of no use, okay? Um, up here we have as well how to use that auxiliary relay, 
As I said, the auxiliary relay can be used to handle that external contactor. Mm -hmm. That is not selected on this window, that's selected on a different window. Uh, what we select on this window is for a more basic usage of, um, of that auxiliary relay that we have on the inverter, right? So these are the triggers. We can trigger a low battery, we can trigger on high battery, we can trigger on temperature, we can trigger on fault, we can trigger on a different point of the charge cycle as bulk and absorption. Uh, we can trigger on time of day and we can trigger it on state of charge. We can trigger on temperature of the heat sink. You can drive with that whatever your heart wants to. An external relay, a light, an SMS message, whatever you want. Now, if we want to use one of those big systems, right, more than 60 amps, and we want to use that external relay, this is how we actually enable that. We enable that external transfer contactor. So that will tell the inverter to use all five pins on the auxiliary contact so it can drive the contactor and it can get a signal of success back from the contactor to two of those pins, okay? And, and, and that is the reason of why it is separated from the, the basic auxiliary relay menu, okay? There is many other uh, functions here that, that can be enabled. One of them is AC cooking. As you can see, if the system is disabled, there is no other sources of AC on the lower output or on the low input, on the AC input. Uh, but this is how the AC coupling is enabled, okay? So um, this is another interesting one. You can have two different inverters with two different batteries battery banks, battery one, battery two, in a single phase system. So you can actually click this on and you can have one inverter to balance the energy of the inverter battery banks. So in essence, regardless of what the loads are on the inverters, this feature will try and keep the inverters with the same, the battery banks with the same voltage. Um, the rest not very common features. I think we don't have enough time um, to cover them on this teleconference. Um, another very important one is associations. So this is another one that would, will give you a configuration error if they are not the same. So this inverter and this brother share the same grid, share the same generator, and share the same load and the same battery bank. So it's important that we keep those to the same, the same value. Now, the grid support menu, extremely fundamental to get good performance out of your inverter. So this is how we tell the inverter not to be a backup device. If you do not, switch on the grid support here or in the SCP on its equivalent menu, the inverter will not produce any power. It will just sit there and wait for the grid to fail. So this needs to be enabled for the inverter to start working on any of the grid support functions that the inverter can do. So either enhance or either basic grid support. So here we are on basic grid support. You can see the grid support has been set to 52, 52 volts. Uh, so in between full and 52, uh, these inverters will make its very best effort to supply all the energy the loads require from the battery and or the PV. Now, there is another function here which is very interesting, which is load shape. Uh, you can see at this point is disabled, but you see this slider here on the bottom, you can actually select a point into which or from which the inverter will start supplying the power to the loads. Uh, if that is set to zero and the load shape is enabled, you are telling essentially the inverter never use grids to supply a load error. But then again, as we mentioned, that will preclude, that will deactivate the AC charging on the system. Okay, so it might, it might be a system, might be an application where that might be a start, a smart way and a smart choice. Um, so it's there. Okay, so and here we have some other very interesting features, which is active power control. You can use these inverters with batteries and, and with or without PV, to stabilize uh, a weak grid. So let me, let me just elaborate there. So let's say we have a small village. This small village has a supply of 230 volts single phase. Uh, therefore, because of the very big swing and load uh, on that very small supply, you're gonna have very big swings on frequency and that causes havoc on that small village, right? So you could have a set of uh, HW inverters in parallel, which are going to be reacting uh, based on frequency and injecting and, and withdrawing power from the grid in order to stabilize the frequency. So you could use the inverters and batteries as a frequency stabilization device, um, which is a very easy way to fix a problem because sometimes making a new power line can be very costly and time consuming. 
So this is something that actually has been used in Africa quite a bit in some applications. Now the AC settings, these are the windows that your inverter uses to determine if it can use the AC sources. So are fully configurable, the maximum and the minimum are determined by your grid code. So this doesn't allow you to go any much higher or much lower in your grid code, okay? So you have frequency low, frequency high, AC voltage low, AC voltage high. Uh, the same thing for AC2, no? AC1 and AC2. What is important here is that once you fit an AC source to your inverter, it will not immediately take it. It will wait a certain period of time. The period of time is configurable. You can see here, AC1 transfer switch delay and AC2 transfer switch delay. When you're using a generator, you have to be careful that your AC2 transfer switch delay, the time is longer than the time that your generator has been set to start warm up, accelerate, and be ready to supply loads. You don't want the inverter to start drawing power before your generator is ready. So there's a little bit of know-how involved in uh, connecting a generator with the automatic uh, generator switch and with this parameter, okay? Um, okay, well, that, that's that very much is it, you see. From the, the comfort of your same desktop or laptop, you can do all this configuration. Now, this very same system, we can have access to it um, via the cloud interface, okay? So we're gonna try and see the very same system here. Okay, let's see how the internet gods are today. Okay, internet not, not very brilliant today. There you go. So this is the very same site. You can see here um, all the devices that are connected to it. And we can actually go on and make changes to the configuration of the devices that we have connected to them. Okay, so at the moment the internet is not very great. Um, okay, well, let's try another system. Maybe, okay, let's see this one. Let's try another one. Okay, well, that loads up. I'm gonna go back here and show you a few more features here. Okay, so after we've done the configuration of our systems and everything is working as expected, um, we can actually do all the setup configuration of our network communication. So you will see here, you have a section to see that your device is connected to the cloud. You see that we have good connection there, connectivity is in green. And we have here our network settings where we can actually connect via cable. This is our cable LAN DHCP. We can connect via Wi-Fi. So you can see there in this, Beside these are the Wi-Fi options. Okay, we can enable the Modbus communication on the gateway as well. We have an option for that. So we have a whole tab on that. We have a whole tab as well on the configuration of the various accounts here. So we can actually manually change the access of the three accounts, admin, user, and guest. Um, it is very important that the user account it is configured to a well-known password because that's a password that will be used by the app. So on, in addition to the Connex Inside platform that we have here, so now I did manage to refresh all the devices. Not only can you access your system remotely with the cloud interface, you can access it from your phone with an app. That app uses the password that you have created for the user account instead of a gateway. So it is, it is fairly important that we actually do have uh, reset the user account to something that we do know, okay? Um, and, and, and that's about it. I mean, that's in simple terms. I think that we are down to the time now. So it's, it was for an hour 30. We're already almost one hour 45. Um, that, is, that is a minimum knowledge that is required to the configuration of a system to be able to get it to a point that it operates. Um, to add it into the cloud, it's not difficult at all. It's just that we're having very slow internet here in the office today, probably because of the video conference. Um, but it's added via the connection site too, which is in our website. Uh, we will be sending you as well with the, um, with the presentation, we'll be sending you the, um, the guides into how to do the connection site to configuration and how to do the app configuration so you can have your customers happy uh, broadcasting the systems from their app. Um, so, with this, we finish the contents of the webinar.